Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me yet again to speak, and the moderators for introducing me. We thought we would start this session actually about a talk of what IBD isn't. We're going to spend a day and a half talking about what IBD is, but maybe we should set the stage and just give you some context of what are some of the mimics of IBD that we see commonly. Okay. All right, so we can discriminate our mimics of IBD on location of the abnormalities, on the symptoms, including extraintestinal manifestations that we may think are a harbinger to luminal disease, endoscopic appearance, radiographic appearance, or even histologic appearance. So the context here is that you have to have a team or a group of experts who know what they're looking at and be able to describe accurately what they're seeing and putting the whole clinical context together. So maybe the biggest mimic of all is the IBD SGI diagnostic panel. Because as you remember, that serologic immune markers, the non-proprietary ones, that ASCA, you can see half of the time in IBD uh, for Crohn's. The p -inca you see half the time, which means the other half of the time you don't see these markers. And then OMP-C, it's again about half the time. So these are very helpful markers, don't get me wrong, and with all due respect. These are very helpful markers when you're trying to put into context what you are seeing and what, and what the patient is telling you, but they are not diagnostic. And so the patient who is diagnosed with IBD based on these alone doesn't have IBD yet. So let's move through the human body here and talk about some mimics that we think about as we move through the GI tract. So in the esophagus, we don't see, as adult gastroenterologists, we don't see esophageal Crohn's very often. It's usually gonna be diagnosed in the pediatric population, but certainly our patients will complain of dysphagia on occasion. And so what are some of the things that if you know that they have Crohn's disease and you see ulcerations in their esophagus, do they suddenly have esophageal Crohn's? Well, not likely, and more likely, is HSV infection, HIV ulcers, don't forget about that, and then even pill esophagitis. So these are the common, more common things that you're gonna see than esophageal Crohn's disease. So this is a video capsule study of the proximal small bowel in a patient who I was referred because of ongoing diarrhea and abdominal pain, and she had this capsule finding and she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and she was put on prednisone, and she didn't get better. So she was called you know, steroid refractory disease, and it turns out that all I had to do was ask her in clinic what she takes you know, on a daily basis, and oh yeah, she takes 800 milligrams of ibuprofen three times a day for her migraine headaches. So these are NSAID ulcers, this is not Crohn's, and so we actually ended up doing an, a balloon enteroscopy study for tissue diagnosis, but if you saw this, you would certainly think to yourself, this could be Crohn's, but, but don't get fooled. You always have to ask the patient what they put in their mouth. This is another capsule finding that we see and that, um, that can confuse a lot of people. It is a prominent villus with some patchiness there and some areas of denuded versus this isn't really ulcerated. And this is a very nonspecific finding and it turns out in this patient, this turned out to be early celiac disease, not Crohn's. So as we move down into, the, into other parts of the more distal GI tract, this is a patient who had a surgery a resection with, and this is, we're looking at their anastomosis. And you can see ulcerations on the anastomosis. So is this cr recurrent Crohn's? And so you'll biopsy it, and it totally depends on, and you need to tell your pathologist, where are you biopsying from? Is that the colonic side, the ileal side, or the anastomosis itself? Because it turns out that this was the anastomosis itself that was ulcerated, and this is purely ischemia and not recurrent Crohn's disease. All right, so this was a patient that came to our ER, and it was a young woman who was complaining of right-sided abdominal pain, 
And of course, when you come to an ER in, a, in the US, you automatically get a CT scan. And this is what was seen. There was a, the bright yellow arrow here is right-sided colonic thickening. And she was diagnosed in the ER with Crohn's disease, given prednisone, and she didn't get better. Well, it turns out that this was actually an endometrioma. So here is an MRE of a woman with erythema nodosum. So aha, an extraintestinal manifestation and abdominal pain. So she has to have Crohn's, right? Well, here's a sample of her MR, and there is no telltale yellow arrow here because it's completely normal. And she had erythema nodosum because she had a viral syndrome. So remember that in the small bowel, lots of things can look like Crohn's. So certainly infections, so TB and Yersinia. Never forget about neoplasms, especially as our population ages. Medications, including NSAIDs, I already gave you a good example of one, and the uh, angiotensin uh, blockers as a class can give you enteropathies. Celiac disease, I showed you one on small bowel. And then there's this horrible autoimmune enteritis not otherwise specified. Our pathologists make this diagnosis and it, could, it smells and looks like Crohn's, but really not. A Meckel's diverticulum. And again, I've shown you endometriosis in the right phenotype. All right, so here is a woman who was sent to me with refractory proctitis, and we did our Flexig, and here's what, she, what we saw endoscopically, and unfortunately I gave away the answer down at the bottom here, so fellows in the audience can automatically say, oh, well, I know that that's not proctitis. This is solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, and the history that she was giving was that she had spent a lifetime of straining and was constipated, and this is solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. So again, a, a good history and the proper by, uh, biopsies done, and a pathologist who can tell you this is not chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a little bit more subtle. This was a patient with left lower quadrant pain and diarrhea and a little bit of bleeding once in a while, loose stools. And here's the endoscopic appearance, and it's not the best example, but one that I did pull from my own files here. And it turns out that what you're seeing there on the side is a diverticular orifice, and there is inflammation around that diverticular orifice in the sigmoid, and this turns out to be segmental colitis associated with diverticular disease. So not IBD. Maybe it's a form of IBD. We have yet to really fully classify this. All right, and you're looking at this going, okay, what is she showing me here? It looks pretty normal. And it doesn't show up very well, but it's a little erythematous. It doesn't quite have the, the nice vascular pattern that you would like. And this is a patient who is complaining of diarrhea. Well, it turns out that the patient had graft versus host disease, and they were sent as open endoscopy. Nobody knew that this patient was on chemotherapy and for, re, for refractory uh, leukemia and that they had already had a, a, um, a, a transplant and they were having diarrhea. And it turns out that endoscopically we thought, oh, well, maybe they have some colitis and that's what they had been treated for. And it turns out that it was graft versus host. So again, you need the right clinical history and endoscopic and histologic appearance. So what do you see in the colon? So I gave you some nice examples, but don't forget about medications. So PrEP effect, NSAIDs, again, can give you a colopathy, and ipilimbimab, which is being used for uh, malignant melanoma. It can be normal, where we have such high-def cameras these days that we are seeing things and imagining things, and our screens are huge, taking up half the room, and it's really normal, and it's not inflamed at all. Again, we have to think about our infections for the colon, which would be histoplasmosis, CMV, or C. diff even. Again, we have to think about neoplastic processes, Kaposi sarcoma, or a leukemic infiltrate. I showed you solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, and also SCAD. So here is another endoscopic photo, and this patient had been diagnosed with proctitis, and it turns out that this is just scope trauma because he takes a lot of aspirin, because one is good for his heart, so six must be better. This is another proctitis patient, and uh, it turns out that this is all PrEP effect. So this was a patient who um, actually was getting prescriptions for, um, for PrEPs for their constipation, 
and this was all um, prep effect from multiple uses of, of colonic lavage. So what can happen in either location, small bowel or the colon, is radiation. And radiation change can happen decades after the original insult. So again, going back to making sure that you have a clinical history on that patient. Neoplasm can happen in either one. Irritable bowel syndrome is much more prevalent still. Bichette's, and again, I showed you a good example of ischemia. So not everything that fistulizes has to be Crohn's, and I try to teach my fellows this as well. So don't forget about trauma, and it can be obstetric or previous GI surgery. So I can remember just recently the most dramatic perianal disease I saw, or disease, was a patient who had undergone some hemorrhoidal surgery that failed to heal and just had a nasty, nasty, purulent, draining perianal fistula. Infection, so TB and um, LGV can do it. Again, ischemia and the dreaded neoplasm can also present if it's an anal cancer as a fistula. So, all right, so those are the mimics of the diagnosis, but don't forget that your patients with IBD can also have another condition. So this is a patient with established Crohn's, abdominal pain, and we have some cross-sectional imaging. And again, I have some arrows here that are pointing at this strange-looking mass there in the left lower quadrant, and it turns out that this is carcinoid. So the patient had Crohn's and developed worsening diarrhea, and it was carcinoid. This is a patient with established Crohn's, continued weight loss made us very scared. So we did this en endoscopy, and here's what we saw in their right colon. This obviously doesn't look normal. It doesn't look like Crohn's. It looks like it's sort of eaten away there, ulcerated, certainly not normal, very scary looking. And you think, oh, God, my first thought was, oh, God, this patient has cancer, right? Well, it turns out that it was, oh, sorry, it, that it was invasive histoplasmosis. So this is infection. So lucky for them, it was completely curable, um, but certainly my first thought was neoplasm. So just to finish, mimics of IBD, you have to consider an alternative when high-dose prednisone, given in the ER or wherever, does not work. You always have to think about infection, ischemia, and a neoplastic process. So the, e the itis, the emia, and the oma always still have to be in your differential. And you have to remember that conditions can overlap because patients who have established IBD can also develop something else. And with that, I'm going to stop. And hopefully, I've sort of given you some context to think about what we should be thinking about if it's not truly IBD. Thank you.